This video is intended for the members of my local photo club and is being produced here as a sort of continuation or follow-up to my drop photography class that I teach. Um, once the pandemic is over, I will hopefully put something together to be able to do this in the lab and do it in in-person, uh, hands-on kind of class. But until then, this will have to do. Um, I'm going to stick with speaking about materials and methods that I personally use. So there's a plethora of cameras and flash guns and other lighting um, items that I don't use that you might have. You'll have to basically do your own research to see if your camera works with a certain kit or just um, do experimentation on your own as far as your lighting. But I will hopefully provide enough information to get you going. Uh, the first thing I want to just talk about a little bit is actually the bowls that you might use. I've used all different sizes uh, from quite large to very small and different colors, blue, purple, white, and different shapes, round, square. Um, each will give you a little bit of a different reaction with water. Water is very um, reactive to what it's in, so you may come up with some different looks depending on the size or shape of your bowl. But in general, it's all going to be very similar. The main thing will be how you are able to have your camera and the shot angle that you will be after. Um, for the larger bowls, they're really nice because I can have my camera at an angle and kind of shoot and get the entire circular area of waves that form when the drop hits and have it at such an angle that I avoid the rim. The rim can really be a distraction in your picture depending on where it is. If it cuts right through the middle of your drop, um, that's usually not good. So a larger bowl will allow me to have an angle to avoid the rim. Uh, when I want to get a reflection shot, I have, it's not here, but I have a long cake pan. And I'm able again to sort of angle the camera a little bit and get the drop, the collision, and the reflection avoiding the rim that's around the edge of the pan. Then there are shots where I want to take like level with the rim, have the camera like facing right across the rim like that. And in those instances, um, it's best to have the bowl completely filled with the liquid. And of course, then the drop comes in will cause the liquid to go over the rim. This kind of hides the rim a little bit and makes it more blend in with the background. So because you're going to have overflow, you'll want a little pan or some other um, container to set your bowl in so that it catches the overflow. Uh, the other really good thing about smaller bowls is if you're using different liquids in your drop um, container, eventually the drops from the container will basically what we call kind of pollute whatever liquid you have in here and will sometimes not uh, make for very good drops, very good results. So you would um, swap out the water, you dump out what's in here, put new water or whatever your liquid is in here and continue. So that's easy if you have a smaller bowl. If you have a bowl like this, and you have to change it out, probably not as often because there's more liquid in here to mix, but this becomes kind of a hassle to try to change it out. So basically that covers the bowls. Um, it's just a matter of, you'll find with a lot of this, a matter of trial and error, experimentation, seeing what you get with one, trying a different one, and um, just about anything will work, but those are some little hints and tips depending on what angle and what kind of shot you want to get. 
So that covers the bowl and the next um, section I'll talk about the camera. All right, as far as the camera goes, I have used both an SLR and a bridge camera to do my drop photography. Um, when I used the SLR, I have a 18 to 250 um, zoom lens on it. Most droppers use a macro lens. I don't have one, so I've used my 18 to 250. Uh, focused in as much as I can with some zoom to keep the camera back a little bit. And um, as an add-on to that, which has helped a great deal, I use a close-up lens, just the screw-on kind that screws on the end of the lens. Um, I don't use an SLR anymore. I've gone to using a bridge camera for a couple of reasons. One being because of the smaller sensor, you get a greater depth of field. And with this kind of photography, this very close up, not quite macro, but very close up, you need a good depth of field to get the entire splash in focus. So I use a bridge camera now and a close up um, lens, again, that screws on the end of the camera. Uh, the camera is used in, ma in manual mode, um, manual focus, and I use the hot shoe for the flash, which I will talk about in the next section. Um, whether or not you need the hot shoe is going to depend on how you're going to do your lighting. And again, I can only speak about how I use it, so that's what I will do in the next section, have a discussion about the flashes. The next thing I wanna talk about is the lighting. The event that I capture, the drop collision, is a rather high speed event. So a fast flash or speed light flash gun is going to be needed. Um, I have a multitude of flashes and I use a minimum of two and a maximum of about five when I do my drop photography. Um, what you need to do is to have a flash that is capable of manual mode and has a power setting of 164th or one, one twenty eighth. those two are the best. I do know some people that have used 132nd. I tend to stick to about 164th or one, one twenty eighth. Um, so if you have a flash that is capable of that, you're all set. If you need to buy a flash, just make sure it has manual mode capability and has power settings that go to those numbers, 164th or 1, 128th. Um, one thing to be aware of though is that if you have a flash or you're buying flashes, you don't want to mix brands and even models of the same brand. That is because they don't even, even though they might have the same power number, 164th, that doesn't necessarily mean that the duration is the same. And again, um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. I have a high speed flash photography class that I teach where I go into much more detail about this. So again, if we get to where we can have classes in the lab, I recommend you take that if you're interested in this kind of thing. But basically what I'm saying is um, this flash, which is a Canon, I can set this to 164th. And this flash, which is a Sun Pack, I could set to 164th. And that doesn't mean they're going to be the same flash duration or the same speed. Um, matter of fact, this one, the Sun Pack is much slower. So you're going to get um, incorrect off sync lighting, one will have light that flashes, the duration is longer than the other, so you're going to get ghosting or blurring, double exposures, that kind of thing. 
So you want to, if you're going to use multiple flashes, stick with the same flash, multiple um, of the same flash. That said, it could be that the two are not so different that it would make a difference, but I'd hate for you to go out and spend the money and buy some flashes not realizing that there is that possibility and you end up getting incompatible flashes for this kind of work. So that covers the um, flash duration, the settings. Again, you want it to be able to ha uh, be put in manual mode with some power settings of 1 64th and 1 1 28th, somewhere in that range. Again, 1 32nd might work, but the faster the better, or the lower the power the better. Again, I go into more detail in my high speed class. So how the flashes are fired um, depends on how I set up my kit. My particular water drop kit has the capability of firing the camera independently of firing the flashes. It can do both um, separately. But if I chose that option to have the kit control the flashes, then it forces me to do my photography, my um, water drop photography in a darkened room. And I would prefer to be in a normally lit room and in order to do that I just have the kit fire the camera and then the camera fire the flashes and that way again I'm able to do my water drop photography in a normally lit room which is so much easier. So how is that done? Well like I said I have the kit connected to the camera and it will fire the camera. So to get the camera then to fire the flashes, which are set in multiple areas around the bowl or whatever I'm um, dropping into, I need to have some way to do that communication. And what I use is a um, remote flash trigger. These come in a variety of brands, sizes, shapes, um, I went with the cheapest and they work great so don't think you have to spend a lot of money I think I spent about 20 bucks and got the transmitter and about two or three receivers now this was several years ago so I can't say how much they cost now but just know that the cheaper ones do work just fine so the way this works is you put the transmitter onto the hot shoe of the camera and it has uh, little switches this particular one has little switches this is a radio frequency RF transmitter and you just make sure these switches are identical on the transmitter and on the receiver and if one combination in this case there's four toggles doesn't work you just change one of the toggles change the exact same toggle on the receiver and see if that works um, so anyway, all you do is you put the transmitter on the hot shoe, like such, and the receiver, which requires, on this one, two double, uh, AAA batteries. There are two AAA batteries. This has an internal battery that lasts a long, long time, um, don't need to worry about it. Uh, I've only had to change it once in seven years. So. so the receiver then goes on the flash. The transmitter does not have an on off button. The receiver does. So I turn on the receiver, get my cameras on. And then it's just a matter of firing again the kit will fire the camera and the camera in turn will fire the flash. So with this kind of setup, multiple uh, receivers, you can have multiple flashes with each with their own receiver and the camera will fire them all. The um, transmitter on the camera's hot shoe will fire them all. 
So it works great. It's really easy um, and relatively cheap to have multiple flashes around your scene and just fire them with the um, transmitter on the hot shoe. Um, the only other thing I want to mention about the flashes is that if you're using clear water, even if it's got food coloring in it, if the liquid is clear, you have um, better luck getting nice images if you point the flashes at the background and not at the water. Um, the flash hitting just clear water will cause um, bright specular highlights and really kind of bad ref reflections back. So you, if you point the flash at the background, then the water drop looks much nicer. If you're using opaque liquid, such as milk or something like that, then it works fine to have the flash pointing at the water, or I mean at the um, liquid. It doesn't cause so much of that specular highlights. It still might have some, you still should diffuse the flash in some way um, by having you know a little diffuser in front of it or diffusers around your bowl and then the flash is back a little bit. There's a multitude of ways to diffuse the light so that you don't get that real bright hot spot on the liquid. Um, again, with clear liquid, it, you're better off to point the flash at the background, have a nice colored background, and the liquid then is not hit directly with the light. So those are the only real tips I can give you offhand on the direction of the flash. So I think it's pretty obvious that I don't do a whole lot of video. Um, this section is going to be some additional information on things I talked about in the video as well as then moving on to new topics because uh, I want to go beyond the manual method of water drop photography and talk about the more advanced uh, use of kits. Uh, first though, I do want to clarify a few things and add a few things to the topics that I talked about already. And the first being the catch bowl. I did mention in the video that it sometimes, most of the time, looks better if you have the liquid in the bowl all the way up to the rim so that it sort of hides the rim a little bit in the back. Um, uh, what I didn't say is that you need to make sure the bowl is level because here in this picture you can see that the left side the water has gotten to the top of the rim, but because the bowl is crooked, it is not quite up there yet on the right side. So that looks kind of bad. So make sure your bowl's level. Like this, and it looks much nicer. And depending on the background, it can blend right in. Makes for a very nice, clean looking picture. Uh, speaking of clean, these are mostly straight out of the camera. So I haven't done any post-processing. I would normally get rid of all these little strays flying around and do some other adjustments. But for this class, these are just straight out of the camera. Then I also talked about a long pan to catch um, reflections. Of course, if the collision happens very close to the surface, you're not going to see much of a reflection. but if it's a higher collision, you'll be able to see. Um, almost every image you take, you're going to need to do some post-processing. Uh, even if you've cleaned all the bubbles from the previous drop, this drop, this next drop might cause bubbles. And you do want to make sure you try to clean them off and also let the contents of the bowl settle. Because as you know, when water gets um, disrupted, it'll wave out and in and out and in and in, you know, until it, so you need to wait till the water settles and then also clear out the bubbles and other things that may be in the water. 
before you do your next drop. The camera settings. I talked a little bit about the camera. You use it in manual mode when you do this kind of work. Currently I use a shutter speed of 1 1 60th. My aperture is um, at f9, but if you recall, I stated that I use a bridge camera. I think my bridge camera, the one I use now, only goes to f16. If you're using a SLR, you will probably need to stop down even more to get a good depth of field. Um, and then an ISO of 100. If you stop down and you need more light, you could open it back up, but again, you got to watch that depth of field. So you could um, up your ISO a little bit or work with your flashes a little bit as far as the distance or even the power. I also mentioned that you need to put your camera in manual focus but I didn't quite talk about what to focus on. So you put your camera in manual focus. I bought this huge bolt at Home Depot, put it in the bowl, and I focus right where the bolt and the water surface meet. Um, if you don't have something like that, anything that you could put across the bowl, in this case, this is a one of those bamboo skewers, and then you can focus on that. Just make sure that that's where your drop's hitting. So put the bolt or the skewer on or in the bowl. Um, get your drop going. Make sure your drop hits. You know, move your bowl so it's in the right position and then focus on that. And then, of course, remove the bolt or the skewer. Next, uh, talk a little bit more on the flash. I spoke about um, needing to get a flash that it has the capability of manual mode and then setting it to the lowest power possible, in this case 1 over 128, 1 one ten, 128th. Um, that's best. That will produce your shortest duration or fastest flash. And again, I talk more detail when I teach my high-speed flash photography class at the club. If it doesn't, if your flash doesn't go to 128, 1 over 128, 1 64th does work as well. Um, 1 32nd, I think I mentioned, you're getting in close to that point where it might be too long of a duration and you might get some blurring. So in that case, go to 1 64th or 1 over 128. And the positioning of the flashes, I talked about a little bit. Um, when your liquid is clear, you can avoid a lot of the specular highlights and the hot spots by pointing your flash at the background. Here I have this one pointing at the background. This green one is pointing right at the base of the flash that's one of the things you'll find if, you're, if your flashes are all pointing at the background, the very front of the, of the drop is kind of in shadow. So I kind of, you know, I've got these gels on the flashes, a little bit of diffusion in that, and I pointed it kind of so it lights up the front a little bit. Um, and this, this flash here, this one with the blue, is pointing down at the water. And that's one advantage of using a clear bowl. If you have clear liquid in a clear bowl, you can point the flash into the liquid and light it up from the bottom. So that works. And here's, you can tell a little bit on this one that the front is a little dark because I've got both flashes here pointing at the background. When, when your liquid is an opaque liquid, such as milk, you uh, have less of a um, chance for these really uh, bright hot spots. They can still occur, but you have uh, less of them show up and be uh, really annoying and 
overly bright, so you can point your flashes right at the liquid, right at the drop. And in this case, I've got this blue one kind of pointing down at the liquid, this green one up this way, purple, you know, so I've got them pointing all over to get the uh, collision well lit. And then this is another case of the um, opaque liquid and I'm pointing the flashes at the liquid and you can see some highlights here but they're not bad. They're not like when it's clear. When it's clear the hot spots are really really bad. Also when you have, um, I spoke about the different liquid in the bottle as opposed to the bowl and that as the bottle liquid as you do the drops mixes with the liquid in the bowl and you can see here sometimes it looks pretty good but it will change the consistency of the bowl so if it starts to not produce good collisions just swap out the liquid out of the bowl and start with fresh Another flash technique is to um, really point them at the background but far enough away that when you crop, even though there's bright highlights in the picture, you're going to, like I mentioned, crop your picture and so that will eliminate those and give you this nice lighting behind the collision. And then again, if you have a clear bowl, in this case I have a clear pan, and I put some blue uh, food coloring in the water and pointed the flash really low so that it lights up through the liquid and kind of looks like a, I don't know, a pool or something. So that's another little um, idea, and I'm sure you could come up with some on your own to make your own um, effects. So now a little bit about the background, which I didn't talk about in the video. The background can be anything. Um, I printed a um, picture with just pastel colors throughout, and that works great as a background. I also have these color gels, which I use in conjunction to add even more color. So that's one of the things I've used. And that produces a really nice clean background with just a different colors throughout. I uh, really like a black background. And most of the time I would be cleaning up all these stray drops, but actually in this picture I would leave them because they kind of add to the whole kind of starry look there. And then there's the uh, technique of doing a refraction in your drop. So in this case, I took a flag and put it, it has to be upside down because in the refraction, it's going to flip. And then I got this picture here. And believe me, it took a lot of takes to get this, to line it up right and everything. But um, yeah, you can put something behind the, picture, the um, drop with a picture and then it will show up in your drop upside down, which in this case is right side up. So this did well in competition also. Then there's the topic of additives, things that you add to the liquid, to the mixture. Plain water by itself usually results in a very stubby little collision that is not very impressive. But once you add a thickener to the water, then it reacts much, much better. You get higher jets, better collisions, and um, much better images. And that's adding a thickener to the water. One of the very common thickeners to add is called xanthan gum. And it is a, a food product. I mean, people add it to food. So it's, it's easy to buy. This costs uh, eight ounces, costs about, I don't know, $7 on Amazon. And you use a, just a tiny bit 
so it lasts a long, long time. And similar to xanthan gum is guar gum. It doesn't quite mix as easily, but it does behave in a similar manner. And um, I have been using it just to see if it makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, xanthan gum's easier to use, so if you're just starting off doing this, um, that's what I would recommend. Guar gum, it, like I said, it behaves very similarly. I haven't found a real big difference, but that's another one that people use. Um, this is the recipe for what I um, use when I make my working mix. I start by making what I call a base, and that is one half to one teaspoon of the gum powder, either the xanthan gum or the guar gum, and you sprinkle that into a liter of warm water. And you have to sprinkle, you don't dump, because if you dump it in, it'll clump right into a little icky ball and it won't dissolve. So you get the water warm, really hot, not boiling, but hot on the stove. And then I would sprinkle in the powder as I stir gently with a whisk. And once all of it's sprinkled in and stirred in and it looks like it's mixed, I will then turn off the heat and let it cool and then just um, stir it with a slotted spoon until it's cool. So that I call the base. That's the base. The working mix, the mix that actually goes into the bottle, is one part of that base plus three parts of water. That's really my go-to mix. Now, in water drop photography, there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of trying this, trying that. So I've done a variety of different dilutions, but one part base and three parts water um, works well almost every time as a starter. Another product that people have tried is called Thicken Up, Thicken Up Clear. Uh, this is, I found this at Walgreens and it's kind of a medical-ish kind of product to help people swallow. If people have trouble swallowing, it thickens up the liquid, which I guess helps people swallow. Um, the, the nice part about this stuff is it is clear, clear. Whereas the gum mix, the xanthan gum and the guar gum, when you mix it up, it does look like it's cloudy, but once you actually dilute it and then into the working mix and then use it, it really looks clear. But this stuff is clear, clear. The bad part about this stuff is I just can't get it to work. Other people have. Other people seem to do really well with it, other droppers but I can't seem to get this to work for me. But I do have it and I do play with it. This Nutilis Clear, this is actually a, um, a European product. I can't get it here. I've looked, you can see this is, I don't know, German or something. Um, but this is, a lot of people love this over in Europe. They really, the droppers over in Europe really love it. And I just can't get it here. Um, I could order it, but you pay a lot in shipping, of course. And I do well enough with the xanthan gum that I'm not at the point where I'm going to pay for some of this yet. But that's something for the future. Now, besides the thickening of the water, um, a frequently used thing to um, reduce surface tension is rinse aid or the jet dry stuff. This is just Dollar General rinse aid. Just a drop or two of this stuff and the whole collision will change. I mean the jet will go higher and it just a drop or two is all you need. Um, and the same thing with, with some soap. It probably doesn't react quite as much, but soap is another additive that droppers use to get a different reaction 
from the collision. And then there is paint, acrylic paint. Uh, once I discovered that people use acrylic paint, this has been, I, I love it. I use it a lot. Um, I've used a variety of different brands. They all, again, with liquids, they all react a little bit differently. Some mix well, some don't mix well, some you have to use a lot, some not so much. Even different colors of the same brand react differently. Uh, even the um, cheap stuff at Walmart, the Apple Barrel, that, that works fine too. So acrylic paint though, don't get um, latex or anything like that. So clearly you can see that this can be a little bit messy. But as long as you know that ahead of time and you take precautions like all these plastic drapes I've got on the table and up the side here and catch bowl with the overflow bowl which I talked about, as long as you have it all under control, it's not that bad. And liquid collisions such as this cannot be achieved by manual dropping. You are going to need an electronic kit if you want to start getting collisions that are more sophisticated like this one. So now I'm going to talk about electronic drop kits. Before I do, I want to just say that Water drop photography, once you go beyond the manual method where you just use some bottle that's in your house to drop into a bowl, once you go beyond that, there's going to be an investment, a couple of investments. An investment of money to buy the equipment, but also an investment in time. This stuff doesn't come easy. It takes time. You need to practice. You need to dedicate yourself to um, learning and practicing trial and error. It takes time. I just want to impress upon you that this isn't just a plug and play kind of thing. Once you start getting into this kind of the drop kits and more sophisticated dropping. That said, my hope is that this presentation will kind of get you into a position where you don't have to bother with the manual part or learning about the flash and all that, that I've, I'm teaching you that here so that you can kind of avoid that part of the time commitment and maybe get right into um, doing some more sophisticated stuff. So. Just like with the manual method, using an electronic kit, it starts with a container to hold the drop liquid. And all of the kits come with the container. That's part of the kit. The next part is the valve. And the valve is what opens and lets the water or whatever liquid through and closes so that you get drops. And then of course the controller to control that valve as far as how much, how long it stays open, which then translate to how big the drops are. I'm going to just show the most popular kits at this point in time and to give you an idea of what's available out there. This is the MyOps and I'll give you the um, the links, the URLs to all these products at the end of this. The MyOps has the container, the, the tube or bottle, and the valve right here. The electronics for the valve are in this little casing, and then you get this arm that you attach to, I guess, a tripod or something 
to hold it all up. And that one runs about $149. Then there's the Pluto. And the Pluto is very similar. It's got this tube for the container. The valve is here. The electronics, oddly enough, which is kind of strange for something that is used with liquids, the electronics are kind of exposed a little bit. And then you get this arm, again, for the tripod or whatever to hold it, and then some cables and whatnot. And this one is about 179 And I say about because by the time this is out there and people see it, the prices may have changed. Then there is the, you don't see it anywhere here, but it's the MJKZZ. Uh, this guy is based in China. However, there is a U.S. distributor. And the price runs approximately $229. You get the container with the valve and the electronics on the valve. You get a controller and you get a, a little remote. And I, you get this arm as well, but of course not this nice tripod. So that's the MJKZZ. Then there's the Splash Art. This um, guy is based in the UK. And the Splash Art runs about 250. And of course, that's the bottle, the valve, the electronics for the valve, the control box, and the cables. You also get this, like it's, it's like a chemistry stand, a retort stand, and this arm here and the um, little thing to hold the arm to the stand. And that's splash art. Then there is the Cognosis Stop Shot. This one is the most expensive, $399. You get the tube or the bottle, the valve, the um, uh, arm here. It has a, an additional arm here and you get the control box and the cables. Then there's the drop controller. This is new. This, this guy just came out with this. So this is all I'm going to say on this because I don't know much about this at all. But if you're in the market, you might check it out. Dropcontroller.com He's in Hong Kong, and right now, as you can see here, due to the pandemic, international shipping remains disruptive, and he's decided to delay implementing a full online shop until the situation gets better. So I have no idea if and when this guy will get going, but um, it's another option if you are in the market at some point. But this is the last I'll talk about the drop controller because I don't know anything about it. So, the container to hold the drop liquid, we got that, the valve, and I'm going to go back through each of the uh, valves on each of the um, products just to point out a few differences. The valve on the MyOps, it, um, it looks like it's in kind of a plastic, I'm not sure casing the uh, nozzle you get is plastic and the um, electronics for the valve are in this casing here the pluto looks like it's got the same i i don't know if this is plastic or metal but it looks very similar however the nozzle that you get with the pluto is brass and again the electronics are oddly exposed so if you get the Pluto, I would put some plastic over that. The Splash Art and the MJKZZ have a brass valve, the 
The electronics are encased in plastic, but the valve itself is brass. And it does come with brass nozzles. And that's for both the Splash Art and the MJKZZ. They both use this same Shaco valve. The Cognosis, again, goes back to this kind of valve here, which looks very similar to the Pluto and the Myops. It has a brass nozzle and the electronics are encased. So those are the valves that you get with the different kits. And then there's the controller, the brains of the whole thing. The Myops and the Pluto are controlled via a phone app or a tablet app, an app. Um, so they depend on that connection. I don't know if it's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or what, but they're controlled by an app on your device. The MJKZZ comes with a um, control box and a, uh, a remote that you set the parameters, all the settings. And that's actually very handy because you can sit back, you know, you don't have to be right there, sit back and change via a remote. So that's very handy. The splash art, the control box, oddly enough, has no markings on it. There's no indication of where you're turning these knobs. You turn the knob for the size of the drops and the delay between the drops and then you push this button. So to activate this one, you have to have the control box right there and actually physically push a button. Then the Cognosis is kind of similar. Um, you control the settings by setting um, these buttons here and watching the screen and setting the settings that way. And then once you got the settings set, uh, one of these two buttons, I think you can push either, would actually actuate the valve. So you again have to be have the control box right there and push a button to get your drop going. So these are the different ways that each of the products are controlled. So now you're going to hear my story, but I'll be brief. I'll be brief. Just to kind of tell you my adventure in water drop photography. I started off manual mode. I used a glue bottle and just dropped into a bowl, put some stuff up as a background, used a bridge camera. Only ha I didn't have a flash other than on board. I had to use it, had to work with the shadows it created and everything. But I did pretty well. I, I, it was fun. I, it got me going. I'm telling you, I got, I got addicted. I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Got some nice drops. And the manual method did work very nice for these simple, basic water drops. But then I wanted to do collisions. And trying to do collisions using the manual method was difficult. It was not clean. It was difficult. The only way I could do it was to open up that little nozzle on the glue bottle and let drops just come out, bang, 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 and just click, 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 and hope that it was colliding and the water was bouncing all over because the drop would hit and go this way and the next, and then there's bubbles and the only other way to do it, which some people have had success with, I never did, was to get the drops going real fast out of the glue bottle or whatever and you hold a cup under there to capture the drops till the water in the bowl settled and then you had your camera remote ready and then you would move the cup real quick and hope that a couple drops went down and hit the hit the button and try to time it and move the cup back under no <laughs> no Tried it twice, three times maybe, and did not get good collisions at all. 
So I knew at that point if I was going to continue, I would probably need to invest in a drop kit. So that's when I started researching the water drop kits um, and trying to decide which one to get. Now, I fortunately found somebody that actually had one of these Cognosys, the most expensive one, and they allowed me to try it out. So once I tried it out, I really knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to buy a kit, but I didn't want to spend $400 for a kit. So this one was out. So I did the research, went back and looked at all of them. Um, here is all the uh, websites. So you can, you know, copy these down if you want to look at these uh, products on the web. But so these were the five that I researched and came up with. And right away I eliminated two because I did not have a phone. I still don't have a smartphone. I don't want a smartphone. I do have a tablet, but I didn't want to control it with an app. Even though those were the cheaper versions or the cheaper kits, I didn't want to control it with an app. And then, of course, I already eliminated the expensive one because I didn't want to spend $400. So that left the MJKZZ and the Splash Art made by phototrigger.co.uk. So I looked into them, I went to their websites, I looked at their stuff. Uh, the Splash Art guy had a video showing how to use it, how easy it was to use. It looked so simple and easy. This one looked a little more complicated so I went with the splash art and I got the splash art I got it all set up I had in the meantime gotten some flashes um, I also bought a small TV so I could see the drop and decide what changes I want to make instead of having to look at the back of the camera all the time and um, I also did at this point I was trying out the use of a piece of glass just a piece of nice clear glass off of a picture frame to kind of protect the lens a little bit protect the camera and it worked you know I I got it so that that glass was right up against the lens and it didn't really interfere it didn't cause reflections or anything so that did work so this was the kit I used for a long time and got some real nice collisions. Um, no problem with that kit. It is a very easy kit to use. So I went along with that one and again these pictures have not been edited so the strays are still flying around and I, if I were to edit this post-process I would be getting rid of all these um, anomalies in the water. But once you have an electronic kit you can get some really nice collisions. Then I discovered something called shoot from below. And what that is, is drops coming down from the valve above and then you have a second valve shooting a jet up and then the two meet collide and you can get some really nice pictures amazing collisions with this shoot from below process and again this needs some editing but I'm just showing you so I didn't bother editing Anyway, beautiful collisions. Uh, I was just, I'm amazed every time I do it. And this is mostly all I do now. I do drop into a bowl every once in a while, but I am a shoot from below nut. However, when I first discovered shoot from below, I also discovered that my splash art would not do it. Because the splash art can only control one valve. And for shoot from below, as you just saw, 
you need a valve on the top and a valve underneath, below. And the splash art can't do that. So I had to figure out how I was going to do this without buying an entire new kit. And I was fortunate enough to find out that MJKZZ, which uses the same valve, so I could use my current valve and just buy a second valve and also buy the controller. And their controller controls three valves. They also have a six valve controller. But I only needed two. It's nice to have three, but so I bought the MJKZZ controller. I bought the shoot from below kit and I never looked back. It's been great. So this is what it looked like when I first got it and put it together. I'm using the Splash Art stand, the Splash Art bottle, the Splash Art valve up top, and then I have the second valve that I bought from MJKZZ down here connected with a um, tube to the shoot from below nozzle. And the controller, the control box right here, and then my little remote. Now, the shoot from below requires pressure to shoot it up. They do sell a little pump. However, I wanted to go with something a little less um, expensive. And I just use a garden sprayer. So I replaced the garden sprayer nozzle with a brass nozzle that I got at Home Depot and then connected the tube to there. And you just pump it up a little bit and you get pressure, shoots the drop up, drop coming down, collides, and you get collisions. Obviously a little bit more messy, but again, if you're prepared for it, it's easy to control. I do this on my kitchen table, so it's not as bad as it might look here. And this is my setup. Um, it's changed a little bit. I'm constantly modifying it. But at one point, this is how it looked. You can see I have the drape, just some plastic drape for protection. The little nozzles down here. The valves under the table. I got the pump right here. I've got one, two, three, and a fourth flash up here. I'm shooting the flashes through foam dinner plates. They work great for diffusers. They really do. They work great. Dollar store, you get like 12 for a dollar. Um, and of course the camera and then my little TV to show me the results of my drop so that I can make adjustments if I need to. And then here's a picture from the side. Again, my little cheapo foam plates, my flashes, and that's my setup on my kitchen table. So again, for basic drop from above into a bowl, only one valve is needed and you get some really nice pictures, nice collisions. However, sh shoot from below, you need two valves, one for up, one for below, and you get some amazing pictures with that. I'm, I'm just, I have a blast. So in my opinion, the best kit available right now is the MJKZZ. And this is what I would recommend to anyone looking to invest in a water drop kit. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. At the end of the slideshow, there will be a uh, email address where you can contact me if you have any questions or comments, uh, want to see more, whatever you want, you can uh, feel free to email me. So thank you for watching.